Warning, some contents may be disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. This happened a few years ago, but upon discovering the sub, it reminded me of that incident and I wanted to share it. The year is 2018. Me and three other friends, we were all males in our early 20s, we decided to travel to Bali for about a week since it was cheap and we had time so why not, right? Our itinerary includes sightseeing, trying the local foods, mountain climbing, visiting bars at the beach, basically a typical vacation in Indonesia. It was honestly quite a surreal experience. The country is absolutely beautiful and the food was amazing. The only issue that I had about the trip were the locals. Drugs were really prominent there, especially mushrooms, and the streets were filled with druggies dying to sell us their drugs. And I'm not exaggerating when I say this. One dude even grabbed my arm because I ignored his 2 for one deal for a one-way trip to meet Jesus. I shrugged him off while my friends laughed it off, suggesting that I may be passing up a chance to meet our Lord and Savior. He looked rabid and frantic, like he was about to pounce onto me like a dog that was diagnosed with rabies. I didn't feel too afraid though, as we were confident that we could handle them since half of them were not even sober. However, that is only the tip of the iceberg. The horror starts when we went back to our Airbnb for the night. We had an early day the next morning, and we were exhausted. The place was extremely cheap, and it didn't even have a proper locking mechanism for the door. It had two wooden doors, which swings inwards, and the only way to lock them was to wedge a wooden block through the holes that were mounted on the door. It was quite a primitive lock, but it gets the job done, I guess. Everything was going well until the last night of our trip when we realized that the wooden block was missing. We looked everywhere for it, but to no avail. I just figured that one of us must have misplaced it somewhere, so we settled for using a selfie stick. I know, I know, it sounds like a horrible idea, but we didn't have anything that fits the holes to wedge the door close. We turned in for the night seemingly not expecting anything, since we had already stayed there for six days with absolutely no issues. But I woke up to a strange clicking sound in the dead of the night. I got out of my bed and I thought maybe it's one of the guys, so I nonchalantly approached the noise. My friends were all sleeping, so I decided to investigate the cause of the noise. The ruckus seemed to be coming from the door, so I headed towards them, feeling extremely confused. Who could be at our doorstep at this time of the night? I noticed the doors were slightly opened, and the selfie stick was horribly deformed. I peeked outside, and I saw three people staring through the gap between the doors. They were really close to the entrance, and they were attempting to push the doors open. I yelled at them questioning their intentions, as I noticed one of them was holding the wooden block. I was shocked and I was puzzled at this situation I found myself in, as I recognized one of the men. He did the overall cleaning for the Airbnbs in the pathways during the day, so there was no reason for him to be there at 3 a.m. The other dude asked if the wooden block belonged to us, as they allegedly found it outside of our Airbnb. I definitely smelled bullshit, as there was absolutely no reason to do that at 3 a.m. I called for my guys, and the three men immediately ran for it. I clue in the guys on the circumstances, and we stayed up until morning came in case they tried anything funny. 
We decided to report to the reception about their employee, but the description I gave them were not synonymous with theirs. They told me that the housekeepers they hired consist of only females in their late 30s and 40s. This sent shivers down our spines as we came to realize that we had let a complete imposter in and out of our rooms while we were out. Luckily, nothing important was lost and we got out of the situation safely. I can't imagine what would have happened if I didn't wake up on that fateful night as the doors were close to being opened. I was just grateful that it was our last night there. This event happened in 2006. I myself was 16 and had just finished a week's work experience at a computer store as part of my school curriculum. The boss of the computer shop was a good guy and agreed to sign my forms before the day was out, meaning I would have a few spare hours in the afternoon. With a few hours to spare, I went to the cinema to see the comedy film you, me, and Dupree. Following the film and coming out of the cinema, it was approaching the prearranged time for my dad to come and pick me up. While I was waiting in a car park, a creeper around mid-twenties was walking around ten feet away from me. He makes eye contact with me, and in that moment, purposely grabs and rubs his crotch while looking at me. My instant reaction was bewilderment. However, very quickly, my feelings changed to sheer terror. He didn't approach me. He had kept walking into a public restroom. Taking this opportunity, I moved from the middle of the car park to the side of the road where it was busy with passing cars, assuming that this would deter him from another approach. However, he exits the public bathroom and I spot him. He spots me back and changes directions toward me. He then circles the outer car park walking my way, and I maintain my gaze as I'm not turning my back on this guy. The same thing happens again. He walks right past me grabbing his crotch and makes loud moaning noises. I'm at a stage now where I feel like I could be sexually assaulted and would need to perhaps fight this guy if he made any physical approach on myself. Thankfully, this doesn't happen and he just keeps on walking. I maintain my position as it's the location that I am to be picked up from. And to my relief, I see my dad's car and without incident, I hop in. A sense of relief washes over me. However, I did not tell my dad, but I should have. Perhaps the final creepy event was... As we were driving up the road, I spot the creeper again. But worse than that, further along the road, I see a young kid who looked a little younger than I am. And I always wondered if this creeper gave that kid the same treatment that I got. It's probably very likely. As for the creeper, I always wondered if he graduated from intimidation into something more sinister. He never made a physical approach toward me, but I hate to think of the things that he could have done in the years since. So this took place in the summer of 2022. Every summer in my city, me and my friends like to make small campfires in chill and secluded areas because we don't want to drive an hour to an actual campsite and pay any campsite fee to do so. These also happen pretty spontaneously, so it's a nice last minute hangout to do. There's this one spot near my house that's located by a river that's really nice because no one usually goes there. The only thing to be worried about are the bears, though because living in the Pacific Northwest is challenging like that, 
and my house specifically is located right next to the mountains and forest. So one particular night at 11 p.m., I decided to go ahead of my friends and meet them at the spot and set things up early because I want us to be chilling once they all get there. The spot I get to has a two-minute paved walkway that I have to go through and then I have to take a small trail ramping down the right side of the bridge that crosses over the river. Along this paved walkway is two lamps located at halfway and another at the start of the bridge or the ramp down to the campfire spot. I park my car at the beginning of the trail on the street and bring my campfire stuff like flashlight, a lighter, small firewood, a small shovel to dig out the pit, and etc. I get to the spot, and it's a small sandy beach kind of embankment on the side of the river with a small waiting area for toddlers with their families during the hot summers. So I set up the chair, and I get to digging with a pit with only my flashlight illuminating where I'm digging. I'm also just shoveling the sand right next to me, nowhere near the water. But all of a sudden, I hear a loud splash. A splash so loud that it can only come from something equally large like a two-hand-sized rock. I'm confused because I swear I'm not throwing my sand into the water even though I'm only a few feet away from it. I shine my flashlight at the water and I don't see anything. So I kind of brushed it off thinking that I was just hearing things. But as I keep shoveling a bit more, I hear another loud splash. At this point, I think something is falling from above because, logically, something must be falling into the water to make those noises. I point the flashlight above where some trees are, above the river, and I don't see anything big enough to make the splash. So, as I keep digging with my heart rate kind of going at this point, I hear a rustling past the arc where the bridge goes over the river. I quickly grab my light and I shine it towards where I heard the rustling. I call out, Hello? And no response. In my head, if it was a bear, I should be getting out of there immediately. But if there was no bear, or any signs of anything for that matter, so I tell myself that I'm just hearing things now because I've seen horror movies before and now my mind is playing tricks on me. But I hear the noise again and it clearly sounds like leaves being rustled. So I shine my flashlight over to the area again. And as I focus my eyes towards the illuminated area, I see the naked back of a man hunched over. I was kind of frozen in anxiety and stress because honestly, of all the things I was to see, I didn't think I'd see a naked back of a man. From the quick analysis that my brain could muster up, he looked to be mid-40s, shaved not bald, and medium-ish build, like a mix between chubby and build. And as I had my flashlight staying on his back, he started to stand up. And the first thing I noticed was that he wasn't wearing any pants either. My next reflex was to start packing up all my crap and getting the hell out of there because now I'm piecing in my head that he must have been throwing things into the water to scare or to shoo me away. So after using my reflexive deductive skills, I proceeded to speed walk out of there with all of my stuff. I'm carrying all my things with me and briskly walking up the small ramp and I'm on the paved path now and out of the forest. I can feel my heart beating in my chest and I am frequently looking back to make sure that I am not being followed. I'm in Crocs, mind you, so I'm hoping that if I have to book it out of there, I'd regret not being in sport mode from the get-go. I make it to the halfway point and I get a sense of relief starting to set in me knowing that I made it safely out of this very scary situation. But as I check behind me for the final time, 
I see something. Slowly creeping over the ramp is the naked man crawling on all fours as if he was a primate walking. His head was positioned towards me, looking at me as he made his way to the middle of the paved walkway. He slowly gets up from his stance and starts standing on his feet, and then he positions his body to face me. After setting himself into his new position, the man then starts running towards me. I freaking book it. I ran as hard as I can down the path. My flashlight jumped out of my pocket, and I lost it. But I didn't care, because a whole naked-ass man was chasing me out at 11 p.m. at night in a secluded forest. I looked back for a split second, and the man was still running towards me, still completely naked. He could have had my flashlight for all I care. I just wanted to make out of this situation alive. I finally make it out of the forest, and I run to my car which is only 30 feet away from the end of the forest. I desperately get to my car, and like a classic horror movie, I fumble with trying to get my key to unlock my car, and I actually drop my keys and quickly think to myself, Ugh, oh, I'm actually dead. But I brush that thought off, and I pick them back up. I get my fob properly, unlock my doors, and throw my things into my back seat before getting into my car. This felt like an eternity, but in hindsight, most likely took six seconds altogether. As I try to guide my key into the ignition, I am fixated on the end of the paved path that I was just at a few seconds ago, waiting to see if the naked man was coming still. I feel my key go into the ignition, and I switch my sights onto the road in front of me, and I zoom out of that area as fast as possible. As I drive away, and I'm a good 30 seconds from the location of the horror that just took place, I get a call on my phone, and it was my friends calling me asking if I made it to the spot yet, and all I say to them is, Guys, do I have a crazy story to tell you? They pull up to my house because again, it was actually decently close to the campfire area, and I tell them the whole story the way that I told it just now. They swear that it was none of them trying to prank me or anything like that. And I also knew that none of them would try to full sprint at me with their dong out. But as we're just talking out in front of my house, there's a college student who looks like he's walking home that's going toward the direction of where I encountered that naked man. I just yelled out to him, Yo, be careful, there's a naked guy that was chasing me by the bridge that crosses over the river. He responds saying, Oh damn, really? I gotta go over that bridge to go home. And all I tell him is, Well, good luck man. The next day, I reported it to the police by phone, but they sent over an officer so I could tell them in person and show them where the area that I saw these things. When we went to see where I initially saw the man's back hunched over, they said they didn't see any trace of anyone being there previously, but the officer said that they would make note of it anyways in case it happens again. Some of my friends say it's a skinwalker, others say it's a homeless, mentally ill, or a drunk or high person. And one theory that I've heard from my friends say is that, that it's a future version of me pulling a prank on the past version of me because honestly, if time travel was real, I would totally screw with my younger self like that. So yeah, that is the only crazy let's not meet story that I have. But damn, this is a story I will never forget. This happened in July, I believe. It was around 1 a.m. and it was still about 80 degrees Fahrenheit outside. And where I live, air conditioning isn't very common. So I, a 22-year-old female, 
was sitting in the living room with all the windows and doors open. I head out to smoke, and since everything was open, I didn't want the house to smell like smoke. So I walked down the driveway and just sat on the curb. There was a man standing on the same side of the street, but a block down just staring at me. And I got really uncomfortable, so I got up and I crossed the road. The way my triplex is set up is that there is a three-car driveway, and then a few stairs up that lead into the yard, and then my door to the right, my neighbor straight ahead, and some more stairs to my other neighbors upstairs. I live somewhere with a lot of homeless people, and they will come up the driveway to look in our trash for cans or whatever, and that's fine because they never go up past the steps. So I'm standing on the other side of the road, and I watch the man stand and stare at me, and then he proceeds to walk all the way into my yard, and I start to panic because I didn't lock the doors and all the windows were open. So I start to walk down the street, and I see a man who looks normal, and I stop him and ask him if he could just pretend to know me. In retrospect, this wasn't my brightest decision, but whatever. So me and this man are standing there just talking, and I'm kind of explaining the situation, and we're both just smoking a cigarette, and we're looking at my house. I'm a few houses down now, and the man just keeps peeking around the line of trees next to my place. He peeks around the corner a few more times, and then eventually walks up to me. I'm scared shitless, and I'm shaking and he asked me for a cigarette, and I go to hand him one, and he goes, Why are you shaking? Are you scared? And I was just like, Uh, nope, <laughs> uh, have a great night. And he walks away, and the other dude just stands there for a bit longer with me, and the scary man starts speaking around another corner, just staring at me again. The dude then walks me to my house, and I just shut all the windows and doors, and I just dealt with the heat. I'm grateful for that random dude, because I really don't know what I would have done if he wasn't there with me. In my 45 years on this earth, I've kind of been everywhere throughout the continental U.S. Most people would refer to me as a drifter. Well, I like to look at myself as more of an adventurer. I've never locked myself down to one place, and I've always lived my life to the fullest extent that I could, while enjoying the sights and the scenery that most people ignore. I know that most people don't have the ability to do what I do with my time, but I have enough money to live, and I seriously enjoy not being chained to any one location. I've hiked and backpacked and camped pretty much in every state, but I'm partial to the West Coast more than anything. It has some of the most beautiful, untouched wilderness out there. I've spent some of my favorite nights camping in the woods up near Montana all by myself. That said, if you spend enough time in the woods by yourself, you are absolutely bound to find something weird. There was one trip in particular that sticks out in my mind that is worth talking about. On one of my camping trips, I found a perfect area of woods that was comfortable and empty. Well, I thought it was empty, until I got about a quarter or half a mile into the woods, and I found what appeared to be an abandoned community. That might not be the right word, but I mean that there were small houses just outside the tree line, in a completely secluded and surrounded area. This was a place that houses seriously had no business being, yet here they were. I admit that I checked out the small community, and again, I'm only using that word because I cannot think of a better way to describe it. It wasn't a town or a village. It was just four houses, 
that looked old as hell and run down sitting inside of a forest clearing. Behind one of the houses was a small playground that looked legitimately run down, like there hadn't been a child to play on the equipment in a couple of decades. The climbing equipment and the monkey bars were nothing more than a tetanus nightmare. The merry-go-round thing, or whatever you call that, did not go around whatsoever, and the center part of it was completely rusted and seized in place. There were a handful of toys that were strewn around the playground area, but they were all broken or sun-bleached. At this point, I had decided in my mind that this place was likely sufficiently abandoned, and I went to check out one of the houses next. I went to the house next door and peered in through the back door window. Despite the window being dirty and there being a curtain, I could see that there was in fact still furniture in the house. I could see part of the living room, and from where I was, there was a chair, an old couch, and a CRT television that was sitting in the corner of the room. Then, I did the illegal thing that I probably shouldn't have. I broke into the house. I say broke in, but I just more so walked in because the back door was unlocked. The first room in the door was what appeared to be a mudroom with a washer and a dryer in it. There was a box of detergent sitting on the washer and some dryer sheets on the drying, but nothing too crazy in this room. But then I walked into the kitchen area where the door led, and honestly, that's where it got strange. The cabinets were all closed, but as I opened them, they were full. There was a pantry that was filled with old-looking canned foods. There were dishes in the strainer next to the sink, but none in the sink. There was a dining room table that had plates set with a vase that had plastic flowers in the middle. Nothing about it screamed abandoned, other than the significant layer of dust on everything inside. I pushed on into the house, and it all just got weirder by the room. There were pictures on the walls, photos, and what looked like paintings on canvas that looked like they were hand-done. The bedrooms all had beds that were made, and there were clothes in the dressers, on top of that, there was a laundry basket in the hallway that had clothing in it. Now, I understand to some people that this may not sound weird or creepy, but all the houses in the area were similar to this one. They were all furnished and full of random belongings. They were also a bit messy and completely coated in dust and dirt. It was completely clear that they were all abandoned. These houses were not in use, and they hadn't been for quite a long time. The dishes by the sink in the first house tell me that whoever lived here probably left in a hurry, or with expectations of coming back. These houses were completely abandoned, and they were abandoned in a hurry. The people that left, left all their belongings, their food, their furniture, and etc. I have no idea why they would have done that, and I cannot think of any scenario where someone would have to leave their homes permanently in that kind of state. If anyone has any thoughts about this, I'm open to hearing them. This happened seven and a half years ago, June 23rd, 2016, while cleaning out my house. I was renting a house for a year, and the year was almost up. I wasn't going to be living there the next year, so it was time for me to start cleaning out and then moving my stuff to the next place. This house that I had at that time was fairly small, but it was plenty of space for just me. I lived there by myself, and I had just finished cleaning out the living room, other than some basic furniture, and I had moved on to clean the kitchen. 
There were quite a few cabinets, so many that I didn't use a good number of them. I was looking through some of the ones that I didn't use to make sure that there was nothing that I had in them. One of them I opened up, I saw something in the back corner. It looked like some type of shirt or rag, and I grabbed it and saw that I didn't think it was mine. But when I moved it, it revealed a small white lever that I could barely see. The cabinet was in the corner, sorted by the sink, and halfway blocked by the stove. I thought that it was just another pipe, but it just looked a little different to me. I got inside, and I had to crawl inside the cabinet, which was pretty large. Once I got inside, I saw there was a small trap door to the side, leading into the wall. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. You had to be completely inside in order to see the detail of it. And I decided to open the door, which led to an extremely narrow hallway with a sort of crawl space. But when I got farther inside, I was horrified. I saw that there was food, as well as several blankets, as if someone had been living inside of there. The good news, at least to me, is that whoever was in there was gone. I tried to make sense of it and figure out how long the person had been there and how I didn't know about it at all. I was gone from the house a lot with work and other stuff, but I didn't know how it was possible for someone to live in there without me knowing. I continued cleaning until it got pretty late. The next day after work, I continued... I was still kind of in shock with finding a secret room in my house, and I decided to look at it once again. I opened the cabinet, and I went inside, then I pulled the lever open just like I had the previous day. But this time, as soon as I opened it, I saw a movement, and then saw a person for a split second. They slammed the door back shut on me and I immediately turned and ran all the way out of my house to my car, and then called the police. I was so scared that I started driving away as well. I opened up my phone, told the police the whole situation, and they came to my house a short time later to find that whoever had been there was now gone. I was absolutely disgusted knowing that, that this random person had access to my house for who knows how long. It felt like a vivid nightmare that I needed to wake up from. When I opened up my phone to call the police, it showed that the date was June 23, 2016. And I still remember this date seven years later. It stayed with me like a scar. A scar that I don't know if I will ever heal from. Luckily for me, I moved out the next week. I really don't know how long this person was living in my secret room, but thankfully, it never gave me a problem. Thanks for listening to my horror story. As someone who has already experienced things like home invasion, I would always suggest that you lock your doors because you can never know what people can do when they are in your house. This takes place in the rural farmland of the southeastern United States. For those from around the area, you will know that there isn't much around except for old farmhouses, fields, and the occasional subdivision. When I was around 17 or 18, I was dating a girl who went to the same high school as me. Being teenagers, we needed a place to be alone, and what better than the front seat of my F-150? Often, it was hard to find a place to park that was away from the road and was far enough away from everyone. One evening as the sun was getting ready to set, I remembered an abandoned house with a long driveway and a tobacco barn. 
It was off some old back road with no other houses. I had been there before, and I explored the property. The house's roof had been abandoned long ago, and currently had been used to store lumber. The house had no doors or windows left, and the rest of the property was clearly in disrepair and didn't appear to be used at all. I figured that this long-forgotten property would make a good spot, so I drove my truck up into the driveway far away from prying eyes. I put my truck in park, lifted up my center console, and I put on the radio. As my girlfriend and I were talking, she suddenly stops with her eyes glued to the rear view mirror and says, Um, I think someone is here. I initially blew her off as I was fairly confident that no one was around for miles, but I glanced in my rear view mirror to see a very beat up looking Ford truck that had pulled directly behind mine, and the door flew open. Out jumped a tall, dirty looking man holding what appeared to be a 30.06 with a weathered wooden stock. As I put my window down, the man advances, yelling all types of obscenities from the side of my truck. As he walks up, I hear the distinct sound of the safety clicking off of an older rifle. I froze as the world stopped around me. I had never been held at gunpoint before. As soon as the shock wore off, I threw my hands up and I see the man had his sights aimed on me through the rear window of my truck. I looked over to my girlfriend, who was frozen in shock and somewhat cowered into the passenger door. I remember feeling hopeless and reaching for my pistol that I usually had between the seats, which I quickly realized I had left at home. This was probably a blessing in disguise, as the strange man was clearly belligerent and under the influence of something. I'm sure him seeing my pistol would have sent him more over the edge. As my hands are up and my girlfriend is shaking in fear, I eventually mutter out a, What's going on, sir? And the man, through rotten and missing teeth, shouts, You son of bitches, coming out here, tearing up my field and ruining my crops. He clearly had mistaken me for some of the ATV riders around the area who would often wander onto the private property and then tear up the land. Looking at the man, he didn't look like any of the farmers that I had known around the area, and I had been living here 15 years at this point. I was fairly familiar with the local farmers. This supposed farmer looked maybe in his early 30s and looked to me more like the junkies that I would see downtown. I replied to the man that I have never been here before, nor that I was responsible for destroying his crops, trying desperately to defuse the situation we were in. He wanted to hear none of it, and then continued to mutter, while still holding me at gunpoint. I waited for a break in his incoherent babbling to apologize and profusely say, Sir, if I had seen a no trespassing sign, I wouldn't have dared step foot on the property. The man advanced from behind my truck to my open window to yell, Didn't see no fucking sign? He didn't believe me. As I studied him, he continued to grip the rifle tighter and then mumble to himself. I apologized some more and offered to leave when I noticed that he has me completely blocked in and there is nowhere to go. As soon as I mentioned leaving, he perked up and he dropped the rifle ever so slightly, putting us out of immediate danger. My fight or flight briefly chose fight, but I knew there was no way to jump out of the truck and get him before he could shoot. Time seemed to slow, and I felt like the silence that ensued lasted hours. He started to yell obscenities again, but started to walk back to his truck. As he passes my rear bumper, my girlfriend and I exchange glances. 
I had never seen a fear like that in someone's eyes, let alone someone I loved, and I knew that I had to do whatever I could to get away from this unhinged stranger. I fired up my truck and I put it in reverse as he does the same. The beat-up Ford backed into the road and stopped, waiting for me to exit. I backed into the road as well, my eyes never leaving the rear-view mirror, and as soon as there was enough space, I threw the truck into drive and I stomped on the gas pedal down as far as it could go. My tires squealed and the truck roared as it ran through the gears. I was familiar with the roads and I was confident that I could outrun him if need be, as his truck looked like it was on its last leg. As the speedometer flew past 60, I could see the man following us, but enough distance from my truck that it would be hard to put a hole in my tailgate. My girlfriend is calming down at this point and is trying to rationalize what just happened to us. I drove and drove for several miles, constantly looking behind me to see if he was following. I briefly remember doing over a hundred miles an hour at some point. The mood in the cab changed to utter disbelief as we talked about how crazy the supposed farmer looked and awkwardly laughing off our near deaths. I never saw that man again after and never returned to that abandoned house except for the next day to leave him some ruts in the front yard of their run-down property. Looking back, I haven't the slightest idea as to how the man knew that we were there as we weren't visible from the road nor where we were followed. I personally think he was just some tweaker as I knew most of the farmers in the area and being in a small town, you know everybody. I had never seen this man, nor have I seen him since. I certainly was in the wrong being on private property, and I had heard horror stories of people running from crazed farmers as bullets flew over their heads. However, a couple of kids parked up in what was clearly a forgotten property several hundred yards from the nearest field shouldn't have warranted a firearm pointed at me and my girlfriend was sitting in a clean truck that obviously hadn't been tearing up any fields. Coming from a farming family and being close with the farmers in the area, the last thing you would catch me doing is tearing up someone's livelihood. Regardless, I put my girlfriend's and my life at stake just to park up somewhere and fool around. And I never made that mistake again. This happened a few weeks ago and it was so bizarre that I still think about it every so often. Anyway, I was babysitting my nieces, 8 and 10, since my sister was going out to meet this other girl at a coffee shop. I offered to babysit my nieces since her house was nice and I didn't have anything else to do that night. So I decided, why not? At first, we just watched movies and played video games together. Later on into the night, I noticed they didn't eat anything and so I asked them if they were hungry. They both replied, Mmm, no. At first, that's when I said that I can make a quesadilla for them or anything else that they want, and they still replied no to me. But when I mentioned pizza, they immediately yelled yes. Of course they would. Well, bad idea that night though. When I called the Pizza Hut, I ordered two large pizzas to be delivered. Keep in mind that I went outside to make this phone call. Quite loudly, I should say, because it was dead silent outside. I only went outside because I noticed a bag on the street and I thought it was mine or somebody else's. It was just trash when I looked closely at it and I'm assuming that this was the neighbor's trash bag. Twenty minutes go by and I hear a doorbell ring. It was the Pizza Hut delivery girl. 
I paid her in cash, and I took the pizzas to the kitchen where my nieces were eating at. This is when the weird stuff happens. Not even ten minutes go by, and I hear the doorbell ring again. I was skeptical at first, and I looked out the window. It was hard to see much of anything by this point. I opened the door, only to be greeted by an old man with a pizza box in hand. He says to me, Oh, hello, son. I got your pizza that you ordered. I try to answer in a way that would divert the situation. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't order any pizza. You must have gotten the wrong location. And that's when I try to close the door, but he pushed his hand hard on the door and said, Are you sure? I firmly replied back yes, and I closed the door. I thought that that was the end of that, until one of my nieces told me, Why is there a man just standing outside our house? I was confused, but my heart started to pound when I thought that it was the same old man from earlier. I was right. It was the same old man still standing outside the house with a pizza box still in his hand. I was absolutely livid. I opened the door furiously and I yelled at him that I would call the cops immediately. And that's when he ran off. My sister arrived two hours later and I told her of what happened. She looked immediately concerned and then asked who it was. I told her that it was an old man who impersonated a pizza delivery worker. I don't know what she did after I told her, and I'm not sure if she called the cops to file a report or not. Back when I was a sophomore in high school, I used to be very close friends with this girl, Kay. Kay and I met in middle school, and we instantly clicked. We would hang out after school very frequently, and Kay had a very turbulent childhood. A deceased father was in foster care, and the mom had substance abuse. So Kay's family would house hop a lot. Our sophomore year, Kay's family was staying with their step-aunt's ex-husband. My parents never really stressed about me hanging out with Kay because she was such a kind soul and a great influence on me. Now, the man Kay was staying with, I'll call him R, was interesting to say the least. I remember the first incident that made me scratch my head was when we all went out to dinner with Kay and her family and R tagged along. Kay and I were sat at the table with him and he was venting to us about his dating life and showing us pictures of his Tinder bio and all the women he was chatting to. We both kind of laughed it off and engaged with him not thinking much of it. Take note that I was 15 and Kay was 16. Sometimes, when Kay and I hung out, R would have us come to the basement and he had this room with a drum kit and he would play them for us with the lights off. Anyways, the strangest encounter that I personally had with him was when I went to Kay's house to hang out for the day, and then she went to take a shower. While she was in the shower, I was sitting in her room, and R wandered in and told me that he wanted to show me something cool in his room. Kay's room was on the first floor, and R's room was the only room on the second floor. Being the naive girl I was, I agreed and I followed him upstairs. When we got to his room, he realized that it was locked. He seemed very annoyed and jittery because his key was downstairs. Now, instead of going downstairs, R takes a credit card out of his wallet and tries to unlock the door that way. Thankfully, it didn't work and something clicked in my brain and I decided to go back downstairs and sit in the bathroom with Kay until she was done with her shower. 
I'm now 23, and looking back at it, I honestly think that there wasn't anything cool to show me in that room. And I thank the moon and the stars that he never got it unlocked. I never told Kay, but as we got older, I casually asked her if she had any weird encounters with him, and she said no. I'm not really sure how to end this, but I'm thankful that I never got to see what was beyond that door. This happened about 20 years ago. I was 9 years old at that time, but my parents have also told me their side of the story on a bunch of different occasions, so that should help. My parents are both biologists, and they met at work, and from there, it's history. The place where they worked at that time was a government building dedicated to biology research used in government projects, turned towards the public, meaning they were the ones studying the environment and making environmental protection laws around their studies. This being a massive, old government building, it always had a security guard present, day and night. During the day, these security guards would mostly just stay at the reception and greet people, but at night, they would go do their rounds and make sure that there were no intruders because of all the science equipment and the computers kept in the building. One of these guards is the let's not meet guy. Initially, he seemed like the nicest person. He was really nice to me, and frankly, all the memories I have from him before this event were really nice. He would greet me and talk to me in the nicest way every time my parents brought me to work. He would make me paper planes, which he was surprisingly good at, and then he would throw them around with me, and he would stay with me at the reception in the days my parents had to work into the night. Obviously for me, that would get really boring, really, really fast, so he would keep me company and entertain me. Mostly we would just talk, play with the paper planes, and also watch TV. It all seemed nice enough, nice enough for my parents to trust him with me, which was probably their biggest mistake. One night, my parents had to work even later than usual. I think it was around 10 p.m., and they were still at it. So this guy, who was the one on shift that night, decided to take me around the building with him to do his rounds. We started on the top floor, checking all the rooms and the exterior part on the roof. Every room was so dark that I'd always stay a little behind and wait for him to turn on the lights. Then, we would step down to the second floor where my parents' office and labs were. We checked the opposite side of the building, going into the labs with massive extractors, microscopes, and every kind of science equipment that you can think of. We walked down the stairs to the first floor where most of the administration rooms were. I still remember seeing some maps on the walls and embalmed fish everywhere serving as decorations. The first floor was all clear, so it was time to check the two basement levels. I thought it would have made sense to check the labs on the right side first, as the left side had a flight of stairs at the end leading up to where my parents were. But for some reason, he decided that we'd go check the side first. We checked all the labs, but I noticed that his pace was accelerating and he was starting to look and sound happier, excited even. Once again, we checked all the labs, all the corners from one end to the other, turning the lights on ahead of us and then turning them off behind us when we left. When we got to the last area, he turned all the lights on and then we went inside. There were three separate offices on each side of the lab and on the first one, he hurried towards the printer, opened it up, took out two pieces of paper and made two quick paper planes. 
And that's when everything changed. He picked one of the paper planes, went outside of the office, and threw it towards the end of the room. Then he told me that the one he just threw was mine and that we could throw them around in there. So I ran to the other side of the room to pick up my plane, excited to play with it. And suddenly, the lights went off. When I turned around to check what was happening, I saw him getting out of the lab, turning the lights off, and then locking the door. I ran to the door, and I punched it and I kicked it while screaming for him to open, panic taking over me because of how scared I was of being in the dark at that time. And through the glass on the door, I could see him scurrying away in the corridors, turning the lights off as he went and disappeared after turning a corner. I'm pretty sure that everything I felt, every shadow, and every creepy monster that I saw in there while waiting was part of my imagination because of how scared I was. I balled up against a corner and I could see shadows moving around me in the dark. I could only cry, lost, without knowing what was happening and why he was doing that. My parents finished work eventually and when they did, they packed up their things and made their way to the lobby to pick me up and go home. But when they got there, the security guard was at the reception, but I was nowhere to be found. They panicked, of course, must have shouted a hundred different cuss words at the guy, and I'm not sure how my dad didn't murder him right then and there. But when they first asked the guy where the hell I was and what he had done with me, he simply said that he had gone to do the rounds with me, and I must have gotten lost somewhere. This is a building would take you about an hour and a half to check from the top to the bottom, so even if you're rushing so, must have gotten lost somewhere, is not exactly helpful. They looked for hours without finding me. It was only when I saw a light far at the end of the corridors leading to the lab that I was in, that I got the courage to stand up, rush towards the door, and start punching it as hard as I could. They finally found me there, and made the guard unlock the door to get me out. I don't really remember sleeping that night, and if I did, it must have been out of exhaustion, but I know I made my mom stay in the bedroom with me the entire night. Of course my parents made a complaint against the guard, and when they did, the guy started being investigated. He was fired and then arrested. Not because of locking me away, where he probably hoped no one would find me, but because he had been partnering with other criminals to steal computers and equipment from the building to sell in some shitty market along with the information in the hard drives and make money off of it. By then, he had stolen a lot of old computers without anyone realizing. And who knows what his plans were for me that night. I'm not convinced that locking a crying child in the middle of the darkness, hidden away in some room, is exactly the most normal behavior if you're not trying to hide them and come get them later when everyone has left and sell them as part of your product. Luckily, he never had the chance to do that, and I really hope that he never got to do that to any other kid. And here's the riddle for this video. Hello everyone, it's your creepy sister here. Thank you so much for watching the video. I really appreciate each and every one of you. But I would also like to thank my amazing patrons, my top tippers, and my dearest channel members. Thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it with all of my heart. If you want to support the channel further, you could also choose to become a patron, a tipper, or a channel member. But remember, it's appreciated but never a requirement. I would also like to announce that we have merch now. 
The link is in the description of the video, along with all my other social media links, like my Discord server, Twitter, Instagram, and others. You can connect with me and send your stories there. And don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't yet, and comments are highly appreciated. And remember, your fear feeds me.